Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. Today we will be returning to a series we began a very long time ago. Littlefinger. Since it's been pretty darn close to two years since we last made a video in this series, and the topic of today's discussion is definitely one that both builds on and adds to where we left off, it seems prudent to quickly recap some of the big ideas from the first few that are pertinent to our discussion here, just to make sure we're all on the same page. In part two, we created what ostensibly constitutes a little finger playbook, a list of rules slash tactics he utilizes to play and win the Game of Thrones. A few noteworthy inclusions in this list that are particularly relevant to today's discussion are planting seeds, keeping your distance and your hands clean, and no loose ends. We also included a bombshell of an author's annotation that essentially stated that it was Littlefinger's secret influence over Joffrey that convinced him to execute Ned instead of upholding the deal and accepting his confession in return for Ned taking the black. Lastly, we moved on to a 2008 fan correspondence, where George was asked whether Littlefinger influenced Joffrey's decision to hire a cat's paw to kill Bran. George didn't deny that Littlefinger may have played a role, and admitted that Littlefinger did have a hidden influence over Joffrey, but pointed out that Littlefinger wasn't at Winterfell, and this fact needs to be considered. So, Today we are going to discuss more about this secret and hidden influence, and more specifically, how he was capable of whispering in Joff's ear from thousands of miles away. And end with a very tangible example of Littlefinger doing exactly what we said he could in part three of this series. But not to Joffrey, to someone else. So. Let's do this. Okay, so let's get this started with the author's annotation that started us down this path to begin with. Littlefinger's secret influence on the king may provide an answer as to who whispered in Joffrey's ear and convinced him to execute Eddard Stark. Now, we were pretty shocked when we first read this, as it had never even occurred to us that Ned's execution was actually Littlefinger's doing. And even after going back and scouring the text looking for clues, it was still actually pretty shocking. There are a few subtle hints that seem to indicate that it had Littlefinger's prints all over it, and when you add to that the fact that cutting Ned's head off ended any hope that peace could be made between the Starks and Lannisters, it really starts making a lot of sense, since I think we all can agree that a war between the Starks and Lannisters was something that Littlefinger desired. The first little clue is the fact that Arya sees Cersei, Pycelle, and Varys all rushing over to Joffrey to try to stop him from doing something as stupid as executing a man on the steps of Baylor Sept, which was not only not what was previously agreed upon, but was sure to turn into a rallying cry for the faithful against the crown. But what was Littlefinger doing? Arya did see him up there with the rest of the small council, but he, unlike the rest of the council, didn't do a single thing to try to stop it from happening. Then let's take a look at the two men who carried out the sentence, Jenna Slint and Illyn Payne. Jenna Slint is without a doubt Littlefinger's creature, and we also know that Robert gave Littlefinger carte blanche regarding appointments, so it seems entirely plausible that Littlefinger had some influence with Illyn as well. After all, when Tyrion grilled Cersei as to what in the seven hells happened that day, she told them that the two of them acted so quickly that she and the rest of the council didn't have time to stop it. When Tyrion talked to Varys about it, Varys and he concluded that the two of them, Jenna Slint and Ill and Payne, seemed to already know it was going to happen 
before the order was given. This would be extremely beneficial to Littlefinger, in that tipping his cronies off as to what was about to happen would ensure that it happened so fast that Cersei and the rest of the council wouldn't have time to stop it. That still begs the question of how Littlefinger managed to quote-unquote whisper in Joffrey's ear and convince him to defy his mother and council in the first place. Littlefinger is never once mentioned having anything resembling a close relationship with Joffrey. In fact, we couldn't even find an example of an instance where someone, other than Littlefinger, says that the two of them even talk to one another. It happens in A Storm of Swords, Sansa V. I had to send to Bravos for them, and hide them away in a brothel until the wedding. The expense was exceeded only by the bother. It is surprisingly difficult to hide a dwarf. And Joffrey, you can lead a king to water, but with Joff, one had to splash it about before he realized he could drink it. When I told him about my little surprise, his grace said, why would I want some ugly dwarfs at my feast? I hate dwarfs. I had to take him by the shoulder and whisper, Not as much as your uncle will. Okay, now this obviously has just about nothing to do with what happened with Ned's execution. But since it is the only example we are given where Littlefinger allegedly interacted with Joffrey, it's worth taking a look at. Note that Littlefinger claims he had to take Joff by the shoulder and quote-unquote whisper to him in order to get him to do what he wanted, which is almost the exact wording used in the annotation. And even more interestingly, it is on this statement from Littlefinger that George elected to place the annotation about him being the culprit who whispered in Joffrey's ear and convinced him to kill Ned which, to us, seems significant. This brings us to the fact that he claimed to have taken him by the shoulder and whispered to him. I mean, can you really picture anyone touching Joffrey unprompted? No one is capable of forecasting how Joffrey would react to someone laying their hands on him. And if one were to guess what he'd do, making a scene seems like the best-case scenario. Then, there's the issue of when and where he allegedly was alone with Joffrey. Joffrey is pretty much always holed up in Magor's Holdfast, which is accessible by invitation only, and there's only one way in. You need to cross a bridge that is almost always manned by at least one Kingsguard. It's not like he could have had this conversation with them at a small council meeting, because Joffrey doesn't even attend them. It's also exceptionally unlikely that he would be able to have this conversation with him after Joffrey held court, because he has a several Kingsguard escort, and he wouldn't want anyone else to hear him, and definitely wouldn't want anyone who is likely to report back to Cersei seeing him talking to her son. Now, none of that completely eliminates the possibility that since neither of them are point-of-view characters, these alleged interactions happened when there were no point-of-view characters around to notice them together. And I'm sure that there are still quite a few of you out there who have some pretty serious doubts about this. And to you, I would say, that doing things like this just isn't the way Littlefinger gets things done. As mentioned in the intro, Littlefinger likes to plant seeds while keeping his distance and his hands clean and doesn't leave loose ends behind to tell a tale about what he's done. Yes, he did eventually help get rid of Joffrey, but that was a really big loose end that he left out there for entirely too long, given the level of risk that he was open to if Joffrey spilled the beans. And since Cersei, the High Septon, and just about every other person on the council was completely flabbergasted by Joffrey's decision to behead a man at Baylor Sept, it wouldn't be beyond the realm of possibility that one or more of them might ask the little psychopath what the hell he was thinking. And, because he's an idiot and the king, he might actually answer them. After all, 
It seemed as though the entire small council had already discussed and agreed that their best course of action was to make a deal with Ned that would make peace with everyone but Robert's brothers possible. Joffrey's decision meant all-out war with the North and the Riverlands was inevitable, and they likely feared that the Vale would throw him with them too, while at the same time, Robert's brothers were marshalling their strength in the Stormlands and the Reach. That leaves only Dorn to turn to for help, and that was exceptionally unlikely because the Martells despised the Lannisters because of what happened to Elia and her children. And if that wasn't bad enough, the faith in their followers were sure to be livid that the king profaned Baelor Sept with blood. And as those of you who are familiar with our videos know, the faith wields a lot of power, and is not an enemy that the crown can afford to make. And sure enough, the faithful didn't take long to begin showing their displeasure. Five chapters into Tyrion's time in King's Landing, we get our first glimpse of a sparrow preaching against the crown, which means it most likely started well before that, and wasn't just happening in the capital. There were probably sparrows all over the place rallying the small folk against the crown. And four Tyrion chapters later, the small folk riot, tear the high sept into pieces, kill dozens of other people, and almost rape and murder Sansa. With that single sentence, Joffrey had essentially set the entire realm against the crown, high lords and faithful alike. So once again, would Littlefinger really set all of that into motion with an unpredictable psychopath's discretion as the only thing standing between his head and a spike on the Red Keep? I mean, I guess it's possible, but it seems completely out of sync with the measured precision with which we see him operate throughout the series. And the fact that he doesn't seem to be the type of man who leaves himself exposed to unpredictable threats. And it isn't like Cersei wasn't looking for a sacrificial lamb to feed to the Faith, either. The High Septon was beside himself about what happened. And Cersei would have been more than happy to serve Littlefinger up to the Faith on a silver platter if she found out what he did. So to sum this part up, there is absolutely nothing in the text that would lead us to believe that Joffrey and Littlefinger had anything resembling a close relationship with the exception of Littlefinger somewhat indirectly claiming they do. But he lies as easily as he breathes, so him saying he and Joffrey had private conversations doesn't really mean anything. There's also nothing that indicates that Joffrey, who isn't exactly stable, told anyone that it was Littlefinger who influenced his decision to take Ned's head. Which isn't exactly proof of anything, but since it appears that Cersei questioned him sharply as to what he was thinking when he chopped a man's head off at a place of worship, it seems worthy of mentioning. It also seems entirely too careless for a machine like Peter Baelish to place his life in the hands of a psychopath, who at any moment would have been capable of revealing to the world that it was, in fact, Littlefinger who gave him the idea. All of this leads us to the conclusion that Littlefinger's influence over Joffrey was not only secret from the world around him, but hidden from Joffrey as well. But how could that be possible? Well, here's a clue. When he kept very still, his leg did not hurt so much, so he did his best to lie unmoving. For how long, he could not say. There was no sun and no moon. He could not see to mark the walls. Ned closed his eyes and opened them. It made no difference. He slept and woke and slept again. He did not know which was more painful, the waking or the sleeping. When he slept, he dreamed, dark, disturbing dreams of blood and broken promises. When he woke, there was nothing to do but think, and his waking thoughts were worse than nightmares. The thought of Cat was as painful as a bed of nettles. He wondered where she was, what she was doing. He wondered whether he would ever see her again. Hours turned to days, or so it seemed. He could feel a dull ache in his shattered leg, an itch beneath the plaster. When he touched his thigh, the flesh was hot to his fingers. The only sound was his breathing. After a time, he 
he began to talk aloud, just to hear a voice. He made plans to keep himself sane, built castles of hope in the dark. He found himself thinking of Robert more and more. He saw the king as he had been in the flower of his youth, tall and handsome, his great antlered helm on his head, his war hammer in hand, sitting his horse like a horned god. He heard his laughter in the dark, saw his eyes blue and clear as mountain lakes. Look at us, Ned, Robert said. Gods, how did we come to this? You here, and me killed by a pig. We won a throne together. I failed you, Robert, Ned thought. He could not say the words. I lied to you, hid the truth. I let them kill you. The king heard him. You stiff-necked fool, he muttered. Too proud to listen. Can you eat pride, Stark? Will honor shield your children? Cracks ran down his face, fissures opening in the flesh, and he reached up and ripped the mask away. It was not Robert at all. It was Littlefinger, grinning, mocking him. When he opened his mouth to speak, his lies turned to pale gray moths and took wing. Ned was half asleep when the footsteps came down the hall. At first he thought he dreamt them. It had been so long since he had heard anything but the sound of his own voice. Ned was feverish by then, his leg a dull agony, his lips parched and cracked. When the heavy wooden door cracked open, the sudden light was painful to his eyes. Okay, so this passage from Ned's last point of view chapter clearly takes place in the Black Cells, where we see Ned fading in and out of a restless and feverish sleep. He's sitting in a darkness so absolute that it made no difference whether his eyes were opened or closed, while at the same time, his shattered leg is getting infected, leaving him feverish, dehydrated, and borderline starving to death. As he sits there, his thoughts begin drifting to Robert more and more, and eventually, Robert speaks to him, asking him, how did they come to this? Ned thinks to himself, but doesn't say aloud, that he failed him, hid the truth, and in doing so, let them kill him. Somehow, much like was the case in other dreams in the story that were magically penetrated, Robert heard his thoughts and answered them calling him a stiff-necked fool who's too proud to listen. Well, whose advice did Ned refuse to listen to? Littlefinger's, regarding what he should do with the power Robert has bestowed on him as hand and regent in the matter of the succession. Then, he twists the knife a little more and mocks the fact that Ned's starving by asking him if he can eat pride, and followed it up by asking him if honor will shield his children. And this is the big one, because it clearly plants the notion in Ned's head that he might have to forsake his honor to protect his children, which we'll be returning to in a minute. Then comes the truly mind-blowing part. Cracks begin running down Robert's face, and Ned reaches up and rips the mask away, revealing that it wasn't Robert at all. It was Littlefinger posing as Robert in Ned's dream. It seems to us that something about the words coming out of Robert's mouth didn't add up with what Ned's consciousness knows and remembers about Robert, and his mind began breaking down the visage of Robert Littlefinger was using. And when that happened, Ned blew the lid off it and reached up and tore the mask away. The next paragraph opens by stating that Ned was half asleep when he heard footsteps coming, which reinforces the idea that all of this happened in a dream, and a fever dream at that. So, now that we've established that Littlefinger does, in fact, have the ability to penetrate the dreams of those he wishes to influence, what did Littlefinger hope to accomplish by infiltrating Ned's dream? And how does that relate to Joffrey? Well, in the case of Ned's dream, 
It seems clear that his ultimate goal was to plant the seeds of the idea that Ned would have to forsake his honor in order to protect his children. In other words, he would have to accept Cersei's deal. Now, it is exceedingly unlikely that Ned would trade his honor for his life. In fact, he said as much later when Varys visited him in his cell. Now, Littlefinger had no way of knowing that Varys would go and sort of strong-arm Ned into doing exactly what Littlefinger wanted him to do, albeit for a completely different reason. Littlefinger wanted Ned to take the deal so the seeds he had planted in Joffrey's head could come to fruition and send the realm into a state of complete and utter chaos, while Varys wanted Ned to take the deal so peace could be made with everyone but Robert's brothers. But how does this relate to Joffrey? Well, it appears that Littlefinger, full well knowing that Ned would never listen to him again, decided to visit Ned in the form of a man that he loved and trusted, Robert. He presented the idea he wanted in Ned's head with Robert's voice, making it infinitely more likely that Ned would, at the very least, consider what was being said. The same basic principle could be applied to Joffrey's actions. Since it happened first, let's start with Joffrey's decision to hire the cat's paw to kill his father's best friend's son. When George was asked whether Littlefinger influenced Joffrey's decision to send the cat's paw, he said, Well, Littlefinger did have a certain hidden influence over Joff, but he was not at Winterfell, and that needs to be remembered. Now, given George's propensity to choose his words carefully when answering questions about the book, the fact that he most certainly didn't deny that Littlefinger influenced Joffrey's decision to send the cat's paw seems noteworthy. When Tyrion and Jaime figured out that it was Joffrey, Tyrion thought he did it because he's vicious and stupid. Jaime concluded that it was because he was desperate for his father's approval. We're going to say it was actually both. Now, Robert did say that it would be a mercy for someone to put Bran out of his misery. But the idea that Joffrey would actually kill his father's best friend's son based on overhearing his drunk father's offhand comment is a little much. But if Littlefinger came to Joffrey in a dream in the form of Robert, someone Joffrey was desperate to gain the approval of, and planted the idea that he'd be proud of him if he took it upon himself to take his Valyrian steel dagger, give it to the cat's paw, and pay him to put Bran out of his misery, that might be another matter altogether. That almost seems like the type of thing that might actually result in vicious, stupid, and desperate for his father's approval Joffrey to take his father's Valyrian steel dagger, give it to the guy he saw in the dream, pay him a bag of silver, and tell him to kill Bran after they leave. Now, let's apply it to Joffrey's decision to make his first public act as king, chopping Ned's head off on holy ground. We know everyone around Joffrey told him that he was to make a big show out of being merciful and uphold the deal they made with Ned, which was to allow him to live and take the black in return for his public confession and proclamation that Joffrey was the true heir. But, given his desperation for his father's approval, something Littlefinger would have been unlikely to have failed to notice, if Littlefinger once again visited him in his dream in the form of Robert and planted the idea that being merciful to traitors is something only those with the soft hearts of women would do, Joffrey might actually go up there in front of half the city and demand Ned's head be chopped off on the steps of what is their world's equivalent of St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. Okay, to sum this all up, Littlefinger has the ability to penetrate people's dreams, and he uses this ability to plant seeds. Seeds that will hopefully get those he wants to influence to do exactly what he wants them to do. He accomplishes this in a manner in which the dreamer remains completely oblivious to who is actually pulling the strings, and he does so by appearing in the dream 
in the form of someone the dreamer knows and trusts, and he speaks with their voice. Which I guess sort of makes him something resembling a faceless man of the dream world. He is a shadow on the wall, a mask in the night, the whisperer in the darkness.